This video is shot a little bit differently than my previous course lecture videos. I have two ethics courses and what I'm doing now with these videos is recording both lecture and discussion and group work sessions and then taking sort of the best hits of, of both of them and stitching them together. So you'll see a little bit of repetition in this video. In the two sessions from today, I began both of them by starting the class doing a group exercise that had to do with the conventional theory of justice that, Pol that Polemarchus uh, focused on that divides the world essentially into friends and enemies and says that justice is doing good to friends, doing evil to, to enemies. And so we came together as a class, the first class and the second class, and compiled some lists, which you'll see in just a moment, and then we talked about some of the weaknesses of the theory, but the, the lists are very interesting, and each class came up with a, quite different lists. Um, the only other thing which is divided in this, in one class I ended the class by talking about one argument that Socrates provides against Thrasymachus's might makes right position, and in the other class I focused on the other argument. There's two main arguments that he uses to attack the position, so I divided the class time into both, and you'll see that towards the end of this video. So, so we have this this Paul Marcus conventional, uh, you know, the world is divided up into friends and enemies, um, kind of moral mentality that, that we find widespread. Um, Oftentimes, it helps to try to relate this to our own life and our society. Um, let's think about who, who we have as friends. Who, who did you guys have down as friends? Um, like spouses and partners. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> spouses, partners. When they become enemies, then you got to get divorced. Or somebody's got to kill somebody. So <laughs> that's what we make movies on, right? Should I list all of them? Sure. Um, teammates. Teammates, yeah. Uh, uh, housemates. Okay. Uh, teachers. Okay. Hopefully, right? Mm -hmm. um, pets. Pets? Oh, that's interesting. Sure. How about you guys? What else? What um, we had like almost all those, okay. and then we also had like co-workers. Um, Hopefully. Okay. <laughs> okay. Co-workers. Classmates. Classmates. <laughs> we also said like countries that are like our allies. Okay. Um, we'll, just, we'll just say allies then. Um, what did you guys have? Family? Yeah. Do we have family on here? No. Um, yeah, we have people who are like trustworthy, honest. Like, so. Okay, so some character traits. Yeah. Did you guys have character yeah. traits as well? So trustworthy, yeah. honest, loyalty. Well, you know, those are a lot of the things that the other class had as well. Um, so we'll put trustworthy, trust, uh, loyal, uh, honest. I think a lot of those traits we put in good things because yeah. right. what we do. I then, think you're right. Yeah, that's back from that as well. Okay. So. Um, trust, loyalty, honesty. And that's actually a really good point. Notice that one of the things that we use to define a friend is on the basis of what they give us, we want to get the same thing from them as, as we're giving to them, and vice versa. If, if somebody's honest to us, we tend to feel like we want to be honest to them. We'd be unjust to be dishonest to them. Um, what about enemies? We'll come back to good things in a moment. Um, what did you guys have for enemies? Mm, backstabbers. Backstabbers. <laughs> backstabbers. I like the descriptive. Uh, <laughs> cheaters. Okay. Bullies. Bullies. Okay, yeah. yeah. Please. These are not all uh, mutually exclusive, too, right? Competitors. Competitors, okay. Okay. Uh, how 
about you guys? What did you have? Um, we had a lot of those. Then we also had like killers and criminals. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll include uh, killers and criminals because. Uh, um, terrorists. That's kind of. Terrorists, sure. The opposite of our allies, right? Um, so we put someone who would try to prevent you from achieving your goal. Uh, uh, let's call um, those impediments. People who are impediments. And impediments to goals. We said people who speak down to you are below you. Okay. Um, like a bully, yeah. Well, we'll put that over here. Um, a little bit. What, did, what did you guys have? Um, that's basically it. <laughs> okay. Well, these are pretty, pretty robust lists, actually. Um, and you notice you can, and a lot of people do, divide the world up into friends and enemies. And they, they follow this sort of viewpoint, and they say, you know, my friends deserve the best from me, my enemies deserve the worst from me. Um, if you catch somebody else, you know, helping out an enemy, you say, what the hell's wrong with you? Why are you helping them out? They're a bad person. How do you know they're a bad person? They're, they're an enemy. Look at, they fit into this list, or they, they do the kind of things that enemies do, you know? Um, well, let's start with bad things then. Um, what are some bad things you think enemies deserve? Karma. Karma? What do you mean by that? Like if they're bad to you, then they deserve people to be bad to them. Okay, so bad treatment. Isolation. Okay, that's an interesting one. Isolation. Well, it could be in many terms, like whether jail or isolation from society or yeah. from your friends and yourself. A lot of people in, in the other class said, you know, they should be ignored. Um, I, I brought up in the other class the practice of shunning, which is done in some, some uh, religious communities that are nonviolent. It's a way of, of taking offenders and, and, you know, getting them out of the, the area. You, just don't, you don't deal with them. What else? What are some other bad, some bad things that bad people deserve? Failure. Failure? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I guess depending on where you are, and this was the extreme, and I said for killers, maybe death for them. Sure. Depending where you are. Death, uh, let's say harm, you know, we can make it a spectrum. Um, if, you're, if you're not a killer, but you hurt a lot of other people, maybe we hurt you. you know, bullies, maybe they should get beat up. Um, oftentimes that, that curbs the bullying. Um, like justice, when justice is a bad thing in terms of like punishment, and injustice, okay. when injustice affects the enemies in a negative way. So uh, not being treated fairly. Maybe not being able to have access to the same protection as other people do. Um, you know, one, one argument that gets made about, about um, prisons is that, you know, people say, well, conditions are very bad. We ought to improve the conditions. Um, and, and in some prison systems, they are quite, quite bad. Um, and then somebody will come along and say, hey, it's prison. It's, it's supposed to be an awful place. Um, so that would that would be this sort of idea, right? Yeah. Being a criminal justice major, that comes up a lot. Yeah, and, I imagine. And people butt heads all the time. Came up all the time when I was teaching in the prison. Yeah, oh, I bet. Yeah. What was interesting was to see prisoners taking the position of saying, yeah, this is prison, this ought to be this way. Yeah, I feel like that happens a lot, whereas people outside of the jail are kind of fighting for those inside, and there people on the inside are kind of saying, oh, I deserve this. I'll, I'll tell you. Um, one thing, that, two things I realized when I was teaching in the Indiana prison, and so I can only generalize about that, because um, each prison system is a different sort of animal. Um, most of the guys that I dealt with, and this is a maximum security, would say, I'm, I'm not innocent, neither are those guys. The other thing was that there were two sets of stories, or two faces. One was for judges, reporters, chaplains, volunteers, you know, sympathetic ears, and then there was the inside talking with the guys who really mattered sort of thing. And a prisoner might present themselves as, I'm just a victim here to um, this group, and then, you know, 
be much more honest when it comes to the guys that they actually live with and, and interact with on a daily basis. Um, so that's just sort of an, an aside. Um, yeah. I don't know if this is what actually happened or it's an exaggeration, but I feel like sometimes people go to prison because it's a better place for them to be also. Yeah. They actually get food and they have a bed. And free education. Yeah. Yeah, they call it three hots and a cot. Well, most, 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 most prisons don't have free education these days, not college education. There's about 11 states that have it. Um, it's unfortunate, too, because the best way to cut down on people going back, recidivism, turns out to be um, earning a college degree in, in prison. But it's expensive, and it's unpopular. So. Well, let's, let's get, get away from prisons and get back to good things now. What are some good things that your friends ought to get from you or you ought to get from them? One bad thing, real quick. Sure. Embarrassment. Oh. Uh, let's say this is just a shame. Okay, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the sanction of, of public disapproval. Um, now what are some good things? Yeah. What's that? Favors. Favors, okay. Affection. What's that? Affection. Affection, yeah, that's very important. <laughs> Somebody might, you know, say they're your friend, but if they treat you, you know, unaffectionately, maybe they're your, actually your enemy. Um, what else? Praise. What's that? Praise. Praise? Okay. Yeah. That's a friendly thing to do. That's good. Yeah. Uh, support. Support. Um, that came up in the other class as well. That's, I think that's very important, actually. One of the ways in which you can tell who your genuine friends are is they, they do support you when you run into difficulties. That's why we that's why we need friends and family and other uh, support. <coughs> now let's think about this for a minute. So these are really good. Messages. These are this shows that you guys can wrap your heads around this this way of thinking quite easily. Uh, what are some of the problems with looking at the world this way? There, there's really two main problems, and they both have to do with um, knowledge. Have you ever been wrong about, about these in your life? Um, a lot of people are, right? Or have you, has, somebody, has somebody been wrong about where you fit into these classes? Have you ever experienced that? Have you ever been treated like an enemy when you're really somebody's friend? Um, what's going on there? Socrates points out to Paul Marcus, he says, so, sometimes people are deluded about who the good and the bad people actually are. And they think that somebody's their friends. And if we identify friends just with all these classes, think about this. Are all of your teachers your friends? Could some of them possibly be your enemies? Yeah. How about uh, housemates? Anyone ever had a bad roommate? You know, somebody who stole or cheated or seduced your boyfriend or girlfriend, or you know, pick all sorts of things. Ruined your credit, right? Um, are all of your classmates and coworkers, because they're in your, your group, are they necessarily your friends, or might they actually be competitors with you? Or even backstabbers, or bullies, or belittlers? It, you know, these, these categories are a bit too crude sometimes. And People end up getting hurt because they, they make assumptions. Well, if somebody fits in these classes, they must be my friends, and I'll treat them well, and they will treat me well in return. And then that doesn't happen, right? Um, or um, they automatically assume that somebody over here must be an enemy. There's, there's two ways to go wrong with this. Um, if somebody doesn't share a lot of things in common with you, if you have this sort of mentality, it's very easy to fall into an us, the people who are similar, and them, the people who are dissimilar. And us, we owe each other a lot of nice things, and we'll treat each other well, but screw those other people. We don't owe them anything. As a matter of fact, they better not start competing with us or get in our way, because they're bad. Some of them are genuinely bad. Somebody's really a terrorist, you know, the whole point of terrorism is to strike fear into the hearts of people by doing horrible things to them. They clearly belong in there. Terrorists are your enemies, by definition. Um, 
Are all of our allies our friends? No. Yeah, we, we're having a rough time sometimes with some of our <laughs> supposed allies, aren't we? France just halted all of its uh, um, work in Afghanistan because one of the supposedly Afghan forces on our side killed a bunch of French soldiers. Um, clearly in the enemy, not the friend category. It's easy to get mixed up about these sort of things. So it's easy to get mixed up about who we actually owe these things to. So this is not going to be that reliable of a, uh, a moral theory for deciding what's right and what's wrong. Um, but it is one that a lot of people use, isn't it? it it's a starting point. Um, let's look at another one now. We'll look at Thrasymachus. So if, if we're looking at the way that Paul Marcus is talking about justice, we've got um, these basic categories. And I had to do this group exercise for, you know, thinking about what, what falls under these because you know, the, the, the book itself, The Republic, doesn't go into any great depth about this. But if you wanted to apply this kind of theory, as people do in their ordinary life, then you'd have to do a bit more thinking about, well, what are the specifics of this? What falls under this? So, um, friends and enemies, you do have to, if you're a poll Marcus, you do divide the world up into two classes. Um, who falls under friends? So what, what did you guys have? What, what does your group have? Uh, we said someone who treats you well and gives you respect. Okay. Like people in your family or on your sports team would be friends. Well, gives you respect. Uh, family? Okay. Yeah, I thought that would come up. Uh, Teammates. And then other people with the same general character traits as yourself. Okay, so um, people like you. What did, what did your group have? Um, we said that friends are people you enjoy being around okay. and spending time with. Uh, enjoy it. Um, and that they're people that you have. Um, that you share common things that's so similar to what they were saying before. People like you, but also yeah. you share common experiences, which okay. is more things um, that tie. I mean, they could probably fall into that. Yeah, we often talk about this in terms of like uh, bonding. Right? Mm -hmm. You go through basic training together. Yeah. Uh, you're in the same class at Marist. Okay. Well, what did your group have? Um, we people who are trustworthy. Ah, that's an important trait. Okay. Honesty, loyalty. Okay, so let's see where can I put that. We'll put it over here. Honesty. And I think I might have to move this. Um, okay, so this is a good composite picture of people you'd like to be friends with. Uh, what you'd hope your friends would be like, or your family, people that you're close with. Um, <clears throat> they might have one of these characteristics at first, and then you know when you find out that they have others. Um, what makes people bad people? What makes them your enemies? Why don't we start with this group? You said what makes people our enemies? Yeah. Um, well, we couldn't really, we were having like, trouble with this one, so we just said like people that you just don't enjoy being around. Okay. If He's breaking it up into the world of friends and enemies, then it would be the opposite of what a friend would be. And then people that you don't have that commonality with. Okay. So, like, I guess different. Don't have commonality. Um, okay. So, you guys probably don't have a lot of enemies, then. or at least none that you, you realize. Uh, what did you guys have for enemies? Yeah, competition can make us enemies. I don't know if you guys had a discussion about that over there. <clears throat> um, you, you could have, like you said, friendly competition. I heard somebody mention that there. But oftentimes, <clears throat> competition does bring out the worst in us. And it leads to a very, <clears throat> sorry, us versus them mentality. So think about athletic sports, you know, teammates. It's pretty easy to start looking at the other team as the bad guys. Uh, bless you. Um, fans do this, you know. Um, 
by all rights, I should, you know, be really angry with the Giants because they knocked my team out of the contention for the Super Bowl. Although I don't actually, you know, I, I really do like my team, but I don't really care that much about uh, the team that knocked them out. So I might not see them as an enemy, but you know, quite a few people probably would. Right? You, you've seen fanatic sports fans. What else about enemies? Like yeah. someone who's like self-centered. Okay. Yeah. Um, And there's some opposition between being self-centered and having some of these other uh, friendly characteristics like loyalty, um, being trustworthy, uh, treating you with respect, treating you well. Oftentimes when people are self-centered, they because they make themselves the center of things, they make exceptions for themselves and they, they don't treat other people well, right? Yeah. Uh, we also said jealousy. Someone you know, jealousy, you know, Oh, that's interesting. Because, uh, you know, the jealous person, you know, there's a difference between envy and jealousy. Jealousy is like when you don't want somebody else talking with your boyfriend or girlfriend. Right? Uh, being envious is when you want what somebody else has. And the jealous person acts like an enemy, right? Certainly towards the person that they want to keep away, but oftentimes towards the person that they, they are jealous of. Um, but they think that they're being super friendly, don't they? So there's there's sometimes an interplay there. What, what did you guys have for enemies? Uh, we said not only the people that treat you badly, but the people that treat your friends badly. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, so once you've actually got this circle established, anybody who attacks that circle Sort of like, you're going to mess with my little brother, you're messing with me. That sort of thing. Uh, what else? Um, just in general, people that have different views on what's right and wrong. Oh, okay. So it's not just that they're different in any old way. They have different views of right and wrong. Which, again, goes to... Um, problem of loyalty <clears throat> or treating you with respect. If, if somebody thinks that um, if they buy you dinner, they can do anything they want, they can act like a jerk, um, that's a very different understanding of right and wrong than I think most of you have, right? There are people who act like that, so they would place themselves in the class of your, your enemies. Um, what are some of the good things that you get from friends or you would like them to give you or you would give them? What are the things that help build up that, that interplay? Yeah. Second chances. That's very interesting. Or well, often we say the benefit of the doubt, right? Um, it looks like they might be doing something wrong, but ah, you'll, they're your friends, so you'll, you'll trust them. Uh, what else? Yeah. Sacrifices are always sacrifices of other good things, right? So if for somebody who's in your family you give a lot of your time, um, like, you know, you've got grandpa in the old folks home and so you go and see him every week and you spend, you know, three, four hours there, that's really behaving in a friendly way, right? You're sacrificing some goods of your own, you could be at home playing Xbox, doing homework, talking on the phone with your other friends, doing all sorts of things, right? So when you sat, when we talk about sacrifice, we're always talking about sacrificing some other thing that we consider good. If you didn't really want what you were supposedly sacrificing, it's not much of a sacrifice, is it? So, uh, what are some goods that you guys had? Um, like giving back, like the same friendship that they give to us, like being kind and respectful to them. Okay, that, that's important too. Kindness, uh, respect, you probably do that with some of these other qualities like honesty and loyalty. Um, generosity maybe would fit in there. Um, what did you guys have? Um, we said like supporting 
one another, like having that kind of support system between friends, like either for you or from you? Yeah, you know, that, that's a good point. And that probably ties in with a lot of these things. That, that involves some sacrifices, that involves um, these, these qualities that you see as constituting uh, friendliness or the, the friend relation. Um, what about over here with enemies, bad things? <coughs> What sort of bad things should you pay out to enemies? I mean, Adam Antis is thinking, it's okay if you kill them, burn their houses down. They're your enemies. Uh, what do we, we don't, uh, none of you are burning houses down, I hope, or, or killing people, or uh, poisoning their, their wells, or um, destroying their bank accounts, or anything like that. What are some of the things that we might do in our ordinary life? We might be like rude to an enemy, okay, yeah. or ignore them. Yeah, sometimes I can really get to somebody too, can't it? Um, ignoring. Um, there are some communities that are nonviolent, and the way that they enforce their rules is by shunning people. So they won't have anything to do with you if you're, if you're not following the, the norms. Um, what else? What are other ways? What are other uh, sanctions or reprisals we might commit? Um, which, by the way, this, this point of view says A OK. You know, enemies have it coming to them. Well, what did you get? What are some um, We're like ignoring them, like calling them names, like saying like meaning to them. Okay. Uh, calling names, insulting. Um, what did you guys get? Uh, well, we said they have a substantial them, which is basically boring. And like, they also have harm them physically or mentally. Sure. If you think about us as, as groups, you know, there are some people that we, at least our society, think it's okay to harm. Um, we're fighting wars, right? Fighting's about killing. Um, even within our own society, we, we have police who are authorized to use deadly force. Who, who are they supposed to use deadly force against? Anybody they like? Hopefully not. Who, who are they supposed to use force against? Breaking the law. Yeah, lawbreakers, criminals. And, and they're supposed to do so in order to protect the, the innocent who would fall under friends. Um, and if you, you know, with this sort of point of view, if you cross over into the realm of enemies by behaving like an enemy, um, by being a bad person, then it's fair game, you know? Um, now, you know, this could lead to certain tragic effects. You can, you can have cases where, say, families fight each other, or teams get very rough with each other, because they're all friends, so they get along with each other, but the other group, they, they don't get along with them. Um, and this is one of the problems that Socrates points out. Um, you notice that with both enemies and friends, you guys were able to give some criteria. What makes an enemy, what makes a, a friend? Um, how do you know if you've got it right? This is one of the problems Socrates is raising with, with um, this, this way of looking at things. Have you ever had the experience of thinking somebody was your friend, and then you find out actually they're not? I wouldn't bet every single one of you has, right? Have you ever had the experience of seeing somebody as an enemy at first? And maybe even, you know, you have some interplay with them of this sort, you know, insulting each other, but then you find out actually they're they're a good person, and then you become friends later on. I know I've had a lot like that, because I was kind of a mean guy when I was your age, um, and even through graduate school, and got into a lot of arguments, and uh, luckily not any physical altercations, but um, I'm friends with a lot of people now that I would have never considered friends. Um, we even have a term for people that are, they seem to be your friends, but are actually your enemies. What, what do we call those? Push the two words together? Frenemies. Frenemies, right. And those are the people that they're in your circle, but they're actually secretly undermining you the whole time. Um, that's one of the problems with this, this point of view. Is it can lead us to treat the wrong people as friends or as enemies. It's not a completely coherent moral point of view. Um, but it is, you know, it's one that a lot of people adopt, isn't it? 
this is a, a decent starting point because at least here you do have some conceptions of what good things are, what bad things are, what you want to see in a person, what you don't want to see in a person. The enemy would be ideally somebody who's unjust, wouldn't they? Are all of your enemies unjust? By this, probably not. Um, because just because somebody doesn't have commonalities with you doesn't necessarily mean that they're actually a bad person. You just don't share certain things in common. Um, being self-centered probably does make them a bad person. Right? Um, somebody you don't enjoy being around? Are there people who are good for you that you don't enjoy being around? Some of your teachers throughout you know, your, your career <coughs> as a student, later on you realize, well, they were really tough on me, but it's been to my benefit. They were actually your friend, but you probably looked at them as an enemy. I know I did back when I was in, in grade school. Um, so there are some problems with this point of view. Let's look at the next point of view. Uh, so that's, that's a, sort of a conventional kind of morality. Now we're going to turn morality on its head. We've got this guy. As I said in the, the intro to this video, uh, in both class sessions we discussed one argument that Socrates makes in Republic Book One against Thrasymachus's position. So now you're going to see those two arguments. The first one focuses on the nature of knowledge and, and crafts and skills, and the second one focuses on whether unjust people can actually function together. Now we're going to turn morality on its head. We've got this guy, Thrasymachus, and what can you say about him? If you had to describe him to somebody else. Yeah. I would definitely say he's like more of an enemy. He was like he kind of sees like unjust as being the better route to take. Yeah, and, and how does he actually treat Socrates? How does he talk to him? I think he's completely wrong. Yeah, he goes a little bit beyond just saying, ah, I think you've got it wrong. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's like he's an enemy, like he's trying to just shoot everybody else down. Yeah. He insults Socrates. I mean, Socrates is an older man. This is a society where age actually counts. And he's treating a guy who's twice his age as if he's a little kid. He says, you know, you need a nurse to wipe your nose. You know, he's, he's being a jerk. Um, he is acting like an enemy. You guys are, you guys are right. And he does, um, to use that thing about friends have the same sort of moral point of view as you. Enemies have a different moral point of view. He is treating everybody else as if they're enemies, because they have the mistaken point of view, and he's the only one who's got it right. Um, and he says, here's one of the things he says, justice is the advantage of the stronger. Um, that's kind of a strange thing to say, isn't it? If you had to define justice, would you come up with that definition? What does he mean? He has to clarify his position this time or something, yeah. He means like, um, he uses like thieves and stuff as an example, like they steal and get like rich, so they're like in power, with, like it's money and stuff. And yeah, um, he thinks that in any society you've got some people who've got power and other people who don't have power. And the people who have the power, they make the rules, they decide what counts as right and wrong, and that's the way it ought to be. The strong get to rule, the weak don't get to rule. If you want to get to rule, be strong. If you don't like somebody else telling you what to do, get some power yourself. Um, at a very low level, it's sort of like when you were a kid and your, and your mom or dad said to you, when you're under my house, it's my rules. And then you say, you, you say to them, I can't wait until I get my own place and I'm at my own rules. And when you come in, there's a comedian who actually says this. The comedian says, I'm going to leave the refrigerator open all the time just to tick my dad off, you know. I'm going to run the air conditioner and leave the, the door open. I'm going to leave the garage door open so that, you know, people might come by and take stuff. Um, you know, the idea there is when I'm in charge, you do what I say, and that's the right way. And when you're in charge, you won't be in charge because I'm going to try to hold on to power. But if you were in charge, then you get to decide. And if you don't like it, get your own place. That's 
you know, that's one way to look at Thrasymachus' position. Might makes right. Those who have the power get to decide what counts as right and wrong. Um, it's kind of a, a tangled position, but it, it is a position that a lot of people hold, isn't it? Um, so, where are the tangles? At? Let's look at some of the other things he says. He says, um, justice is the interest of the government or the rulers. Whatever is to their advantage is just. So if I'm in charge, uh, not only should you do what I say, you should be looking out for me. It's kind of a kind of a mentality that you would find, um, say, in a mob, right? Those who are on top, everyone else should be working for their benefit, and they'll decide, you know, who else benefits from it. Um, he says, for subjects to obey the rulers is just. Um, what else does he tell us about justice? This is when he's sort of giving us a theory about justice. He says a few other things that don't really jive with us if we mean the same thing by justice. What does he think the just person in the sense that, you know, Socrates or uh, Paul Marcus would say is like, yeah. It was confusing to me. Because, it should be. It's okay, okay that it's confusing. He ends up saying that being just makes you weaker. Yes. Very good. Um, justice is weakness. Uh, it's also being um, simple or foolish. And it's um, unprofitable. Uh, if you're just, you're a sucker, is how he would say it these days. You're a dummy. You know, if you're obeying, if you're obeying the rules uh, because you're weaker than everybody else, yeah, that's just. That's the right thing to do. But it's, it's only the right thing to do because those who have power can use it on you. So let's think about policing, for example. Um, is there any reason you should obey the laws other than the fact that you'll be punished if, if you don't? Not according to Thrasymachus. Think about some of the laws that we, we routinely obey and some of the laws that we routinely break. Um, how many of you break the speed limit routinely? Anybody here who doesn't? No? Um, you still have some feelings about that though, right? Is there sort of a level that you shouldn't go past that constitutes, say, reckless driving? Like how many of you feel that it's okay to, in general to drive about five to 10 over, but not much more? Interesting, isn't it? We, we have kind of a convention of breaking the law in the strict sense, but we also, you know, if somebody passes us going 25 miles an hour more than we are, we say, look at that you know, jerk, uh, somebody should pull them over, and they should get a ticket. And it, but if we're driving along and the cop pulls us over, and we're going, you know, 10 over the speed limit, because everybody is, what do we say? Why are you picking at me? You should have pulled over these other guys. They're all going over, over it. You were driving over it yourself, officer. Um, those are ones that we often aren't completely just when it comes to. What are some laws that we all do over? Anybody murdered anybody recently? No? Good. Don't, don't do it. Um, hopefully nobody plans to. Um, now, are you being a sucker by, let's say you're going to get in a competition with somebody. Um, you know, for something valuable, like a promotion at work. If you were really ruthless, what would you do? <coughs> Yeah, you can kill them, or maybe you don't have to kill them. Maybe you just put enough poison in to make them make them stupid, or or you know, incapacitate them, or something like that. To do that would be to be unjust, wouldn't it? But that would be profitable. <laughs> that would be, according to Thrasymachus, wise. 
uh, that would be to be strong. You'd be imposing your own order on somebody else. Now, if somebody even stronger than you caught you doing that, they'd, they'd punish you. But that's okay, according to the case, because might makes right. Those who have power get to decide what counts as, as right and wrong. Um, this is a very radical point of view. Thrasymachus, uh, you're right, he, there are some inconsistencies with it. And this is part of what Socrates is pointing out to him. And we're going to look at one of those arguments in, in just a minute. Um, but it's also an attractive point of view. A lot of people do hold this, don't they? This is a moral theory. Um, you should probably watch out for people who have this moral theory. You should probably, according to you know, Polo Marcus, treat them as enemies, because they're probably going to treat you as enemies. Um, but it is a moral theory, so we can talk about it as a coherent uh, point of view. Um, and maybe you recognize yourself, or elements of yourself in this, or other people that you know. Do you know some people who talk like this, act like this? Have you run into people like that? I bet you have. I'm not going to ask you to name any names, but... Um, Let's look now at one way in which Socrates takes the wind out of Thrasymachus' sails. One thing i got to say to you. If you, when you were reading through Socrates' arguments and this back and forth with, with um, Polemarchus and with Thrasymachus, if some of his arguments seem good and some of his arguments seem weak, you're doing a good job. Because Plato has designed these dialogues in such a way that Socrates does not always make the best arguments. When he's dealing with somebody who's not as sharp, and Thrasymachus thinks that he's really sharp, but he actually isn't. Uh, and Polemarchus isn't, isn't really that sharp either. When he's dealing with somebody who isn't quite as sharp, Socrates will use some arguments that have weak, weak points to them. And if you're seeing that, and you're saying, well, you know, somebody could have said here this, and how would Socrates have responded? You're doing exactly what Plato wanted you to do as a reader. He designed these dialogues as something like an obstacle course. Not just to you know, convey information, but to train your minds. That's why we've been reading them for, for over 2,000 years. Because that's, what, that's part of what they do. So if you, if you saw some weak points, that's good. Congratulations. You um, are doing good. If you didn't see the weak points, you know, next time you read through it, look and see whether Socrates is kind of pulling a fast one at certain points. And, and it takes a little while to recognize it. I, I don't catch all of this stuff myself the first time. I've been reading these for over 20 years, and I still sometimes see new things. The argument that we're going to look at has to do with um, skills or arts or ways of knowing things. Disciplines, we can call them. Think of your majors, right? Um, Thrasymachus starts out by saying justice is the interest of the stronger. And Socrates, you know, kind of plays around with him. He says, oh, so you mean that, you know, whoever is physically stronger should, should rule like the wrestler? You know, I think about WW. We don't have w, it's WWE now, I think, not WWF, but um, these big guys, should they be the ones that rule? No, it, it means those who actually have political power. Um, Socrates raises the problem. If justice is what's in the interest of the stronger, so the rulers, do rulers ever make mistakes about what's actually in their own interests? Well, you know, think about recent times here in, in New York. Can you think of any politicians that have gotten themselves in trouble, like, say, in the last year, um, doing things they shouldn't do and then had to resign their positions? Anybody come to mind? Anthony Weiner. Yeah, the aptly named guy, right? Um, was that really in his interest to send dirty pictures of himself to, to other people? He thought that as, you know, something was going on in his head, and he thought that was somehow a good thing to do. He seems to have been mistaken. Right? So at least in that case, uh, those who are ruling can, can be mistaken about what's in their own interest. 
Um, do they make a lot of other mistakes? Sure. Um, you know, politics is often pretty murky. And, and a lot of times people think something is good for them. You know, like is taking a bribe good for you? Well, in, in, in the short term it is, right? Because you get, get a little money, get a nice gift, or, you know, get to go somewhere. Is take, if you were a politician, is taking bribes a, a practice that would really be in your interest in the long term? What do you think? What, what's probably going to happen to you sooner or later? Yeah, you'll get caught, and then what's going to happen? Your job. Yeah, so it's, it's really not in your, your best interest. Um, so the rulers can be mistaken about that. So Thrasymachus says something kind of funny here. This is where he goes into the, you know, Socrates, you need your nose wiped, all that sort of stuff. But if you put that aside, what does he say? He says, you think that I mean people who make mistakes? No, they're not really rulers. You know, the doctor, when the doctor is making a mistake, he's not really a doctor. The musician, when the musician makes a mistake, he's not really a musician. Same thing, when the ruler is making a mistake about his own interests, he's not really a ruler. I mean the ruler who actually has knowledge or wisdom or the art or skill of ruling. So Thrasymachus isn't just saying whoever's in charge gets to do whatever they want and that's right. When he, when he has to back up what he's saying, he says, I mean the person who really knows how to run things well, who knows the art of ruling. Um, some of you, you know, may have taken classes like in, in public administration or, or city planning or who knows what else. That would, that would be similar to this art of ruling. Um, now, Socrates has got him here. Because what Socrates is going to do is he's going to attack this notion that the, the ruler is actually, first off, the stronger, and that the art of rule is just about getting power and keeping power. And Socrates is going to distinguish, he's not going to make a very strong distinction, but he's going to bring up three different kinds of arts or disciplines. So there's arts or disciplines like medicine, right? What's, what's the point of medicine? Yeah. To heal people. To heal people, right. Or, or to, you know, keep them healthy or, or whatever. And, and medicine ministers to the body. Um, what's the point of music? The art of music. If you study music classes, what, what, what are you actually aiming at? Killing time. That would be another byproduct, but what, what do you study music for? Any, are any of you musicians? Uh, yeah, you, and what did you play? You played two instruments. Flute and tuba. Flute and tuba. So what are some of the things that you have to do in order to acquire the art of music that were tiresome, onerous tasks? Scales, drills, learn songs you didn't like, um, put up with teachers that you don't you don't particularly enjoy. Um, what's the goal? What does that art produce? What are you aiming at when you're doing um, all this work? Well, I guess like the final product, like when we put on our performances. Yeah. Like even if I don't like the song that we're doing, you know, a couple now, like, but I don't like, I know they're going to sound really good by the end. Yeah, it's to produce beauty. Something that will please other people. Uh, cooking. You know, I mean, you can you can go to the store now and just you know pull stuff off the shelf and add water and, and a little bit of butter and you got mac and cheese. But if you want really good mac and cheese, you got to know what you're doing, right? You have to know your way around a kitchen. And what are you trying to produce? Something that that's particularly good. And are you trying to dominate other people um, when you're cooking or making music or uh, doing medicine? <laughs> The way the Thrasymachus thinks the rulers are trying to dominate people. Not if you're a good musician. I mean, there, may, there are some people who like, you know, get into music and they join a rock band because they, they think it's going to get them, you know, this, this great life of, you know, lots of drugs and girls and, and money and, and all that sort of stuff. Which doesn't usually happen, by the way. Um, most, most musicians are, are poor and underfed. Um, which is unfortunate, but... Um, and there are doctors, right? Some people get into medicine because they want to make money. 
really, if you wanted to make money, uh, if that's your only goal, you, you shouldn't study medicine. You should study something else, like finance. You don't have to put in, you know, years and years of medical school and be somebody's essentially indentured servant as a resident for a while. Um, maybe some people like to be doctors because they like to lord it over other people. They like to be ruling. <coughs> Is that a good doctor, though? What makes a good doctor? Yeah? When they care about their patients and are more concerned yeah. Now notice this. So if, if we want to say, let's say we use doctors as the example. So the doctor has an art, which is medicine, right? And the doctor has patients. And in the doctor-patient relationship, who gives who orders? Do you give your doctor orders? Get over here and prescribe me X, Y, Z. There, there are some doctors who will do that. They're not good doctors, right? Um, so the patient is actually the weaker. And the doctor is the stronger, aren't they, in that relationship? Um, the musician who's producing beautiful music, in a sense, they're stronger than the audience. The audience can't do that. The audience has to sit there and listen to the musician. Um, but notice, the stronger, are they working, are they just doing whatever the hell they want, you know, and making the weaker do their bidding? Not if they're a good doctor. They're actually listening to this patient tell them about their problems and, you know, like you said, caring about them. They're doing things in the interest of the weaker. And if we go even further, what about the art? Who's stronger and weaker in this? Is the doctor stronger than the art of medicine? Does the doctor get to say, you know, penicillin, a lot of people say that that's really good for uh, killing bacteria. I don't think it is. I think I'm going to change the rules. And penicillin is bad now, and instead I'm going to give you a different kind of mold. How would that work? Good. What's that? Bad. bad, yeah. <laughs> people would die, right? Can a musician say, <laughs> I don't really like music theory. I think that um, I'm just going to play whatever notes I feel like playing and um, screw the art of music and screw my audience. I'm going to just, you know, jam out. How does that sound? That's usually what it's like when somebody starts playing music, isn't it? You pick up a guitar and just you know, make a lot of notes. Um, that doesn't work. The art is the stronger, and the practitioner is the weaker. And what is the art concerned with? Is the art concerned with itself, with making itself stronger, with ruling everybody? It's concerned with the interest of the weaker, isn't it? The musician cares whether their audience actually likes the stuff that they're playing. And they have to practice hard so that they can actually do what the art allows them to do. The doctor actually has to study medicine, and medicine gets to call the shots so that they can take care of the patient. Um, Socrates is saying it's the same thing with rulers. If you're really practicing the art of ruling, then you're not the stronger. The art itself is, is telling you what you ought to do. So let's take taking bribes again, right? You're in charge. You're the judge in this area in the circuit court, and um, you're actually doing some ruling. You're deciding cases. You're deciding what happens to people's lives and property and how they should behave towards each other, and you're punishing people who behave badly towards each other. Um, and now you start taking bribes. Um, the, the art of, I guess we call it jurisprudence, would say that's a, that's a really stupid thing to do. You're screwing up. It's in your interest, I suppose, to take bribes in your short-term interest, but it's certainly not in the interest of jurisprudence, is it? And juris it's certainly not in the interest of the <coughs> people that you're judging. And it's going to end up having bad consequences. It's going to fall apart. If you're, if you're being a good judge, you take your, your cues 
from the art of jurisprudence. And one of the things it says is don't take bribes. You have to treat each, each person fairly. Every judicial code says something about not treating people unfairly, not playing favorites, right? Who do you do that? Whose benefit do you do that for? Is it for your benefit? I guess because it keeps you out of trouble. But it's really for the benefit of the, as we call them, the little people, the people who are being ruled. So if Socrates is right, Thrasymachus has got this understanding of the art of rule or the art of making things work, well, in society, all wrong. He's gotten mixed up about it. Uh, where I'm going to leave you is, think to yourself, could Thrasymachus respond to Socrates? There, there are some responses that Thrasymachus could have made, but he doesn't make because he's not ready for the, the battle that he gets into. The other thing to tell you about Thrasymachus is he sticks around. He gets really embarrassed, but he sticks around through the rest of the Republic, and he's listening to Socrates. We, we find later on in Book 6 um, that he hasn't left, and he, he's actually trying to get some information over Socrates. So. Let's look now at one of the arguments that Socrates makes to undermine Thrasymachus. And like, like I mentioned, if you see some weak points in these arguments, and there, are, there will be a couple points where Thrasymachus could have said something to Socrates, but he doesn't have enough presence of mind to do that, you're doing a good job. You, you can see weak points. One of the things that Thrasymachus talks about, and that Socrates talks about, is um, what justice and injustice do. So Thrasymachus says, hey, it's great if you can be unjust and take power. Um, that's, that's the thing to do. That's the good. You get to satisfy all your desires. Everyone else has to cater to them. Uh, injustice is, as he says, profitable. It pays off. Justice is not profitable. It doesn't pay off. Socrates says, OK, let's think about this a different way. We have a just person. And we have the unjust person. Which of them is going to try to take advantage of, of the other and take more than his fair share and um, try to get away with stuff? The unjust, right. And let's look at it like this now. Let's not just think about it in terms of just these two contrasts. Let's think about it in terms of a couple different possibilities. you got two just people. How are they going to act towards each other? Are either one of them going to try to overreach, as he says, that's the term that gets used here, try to take more than his fair share or her fair share? Um, so, okay, so they're going to get along, right? Uh, why are they going to get along? Because they both follow a sort of similar pattern of justice. This is assuming, of course, they agree what justice is. So, um, you know, think about us, you know. I don't kill you, you don't kill me. I don't steal from you, you don't steal from me. Um, when we're judging law cases, if I'm in charge, I don't take bribes, and that way when, when I come up in front of you, you don't take bribes either, and you give me a fair hearing. What about the unjust person and the just person? How's the, how's the unjust person? Unjustly. Unjustly, yeah, that's good. They're, they're going to try to take advantage. They're going to try to take more than their fair share. And the unjust person might get along at first, but if, if the just person is smart, they'll realize, hey, this person's unjust, and they'll become enemies, right? The unjust person might get something more out of it. Same thing over here. How is it going to work when you have two unjust people? Are they going to get together and say, hey, we're both unjust. we got so much in common with each other. How's that going to work? Could be. Could be part of the crime. Yeah. They could be. And we'll, and we'll get to that, in, 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 them, that yeah. option in a moment. How often, what will often happen, though? I think they'll kind of fight against each other to see who has the most power. Yeah, they'll both try to overreach each to other. see who's the mo more unjust. Exactly. Um, and, and neither one can really afford to be weak in face of the other, because neither one respects weakness, right? So they're going to be enemies to each other. 
So if you look at it this way, here's the outcomes for the just person. Here's the outcomes for the unjust person. Which looks more profitable now? Which looks like a better set of outcomes? The unjust person's got no friends. They're enemies with everybody. They're, they're going to be at odds with everyone. Um, like Odysseus's uh, grandfather, Atoclus, who uh, names him Odysseus the man of all odds, right? Um, Atoclus was this great thief. He'd steal anything that was nailed down. And people don't like that sort of thing, do they? They don't like getting things stolen from them. So are they all treated him as enemies? What are you going to say? Um, I was just going to say sometimes, like, kids grow up in environments where they have to choose to be unjust in order to survive a gang violence thing. You're right. You yeah. Know, so they can, when un, an unjust meets an unjust, they can certainly team up and be part of the same gang. Just very, very good. So that takes us to the to the next level. That That's an objection that you could make to, to this. So, you know, Socrates doesn't actually address that the way that you're bringing it up. Um, but Thrasymachus could have said to him, hey, hey, what about this? What about, you know, thieves who get together to pull off a crime, or gangs, or other organizations where um, power is what's respected, yeah. I'm sure it wasn't as life-threatening if you didn't join, you know, a band of thieves back then, obviously, but like nowadays there's pockets in society where that's pretty easy. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, criminal organizations have been around in one form or another for, for a very long time, and they didn't have... <coughs> gangs in quite the same sense as we do, but in, in urban life, there would be criminal groups, and if you fell in with them, it was, it was you know, conform to their things and go along with their, their um, injustices or, or they'll kill you, you know? So it, it's not completely different. I mean, we have guns now, it makes it a lot more dangerous, uh, yeah. Um. I think short term, short term wise, bands of thieves and things like that are like there's a sense of anonymity there, anonymity there. Mm -hmm. But like afterwards, eventually, I think what Socrates is trying to say is that eventually you like the, the, the truth is that, that nobody in that group mm -hmm. is just. They're all unjust in their or unjust in their ways. So eventually, if there's someone's going to turn against someone, and there's no, there's very few happy endings to the story of the man of thieves. Yeah, and you know, let, let's look at it like this. This is kind of an abstract way of doing it. So you could have a band of thieves, or you could have like a large-scale criminal or, criminal organization. You could even have an unjust state. You know, a state that was trying to dominate all the other states taken over, an empire, something like that. Something like what Athens actually ended up becoming. The Athenian democracy degenerated into, they called it the tyrant city, uh, because they took over everybody else. And the Spartans, who were pretty tough and mean and had their own, you know, sort of power-dominated state, they ended up being seen as the liberators during the Peloponnesian War, because the Athenians made themselves look so bad. Um, now, if you have an unjust group like this, in relation to other groups, they're going to they're going to behave badly towards them, and they might actually get something out of it. They take over another country, they make those people slaves, they make them work for them, they appropriate the resources, they could dominate them commercially. There's lots of different things you could do, and also, you know, a criminal organization against an individual person. Um, you know, we have all these great uh, action movies where you know Arnold Schwarzenegger or Sylvester Stallone or Vin Diesel or whoever fights the mob and wins, but that's not usually how it goes, is it? It's usually the, the organization wins over the individual. And they do it by being unjust towards them. How can, here's Socrates' question, we'll, we'll get to, here's in just a second. How can this actually work though? What's one of the preconditions? There has to be some justice between the individuals in there, or else it's gonna break down. And actually, we see this with gangs. Um, a lot of gangs start out as um, benevolent, you know, protective associations. They get corrupt. They become these criminal organizations. They're functioning pretty well for a while. What always does them in? It's not the federal government coming in and, and crushing them. 
they break down among themselves. They get too greedy, they can't get along with each other, they start competing over the same territory, they start disagreeing about things. If you want to make this sort of thing work, you have to have, and you have to recognize justice to some degree. What are you gonna say? That's actually what, what you just said. I was just gonna point that out for a okay. criminal organization. Alas, they would have to have justice between another, if not with others. Yeah, so that's Socrates' counter argument. Is there a flaw with that that you can see? What if you could just enforce terror on everybody? What if you, you had an organization where the top guy or top girl, whoever, is ruthless, in charge, makes everybody fall in line with their, their idea of justice, so nobody, you know, nobody steals each other's stuff, uh, nobody kills each other's soldiers, but they prey on everybody else. Could that work? What do you think? Not for long, but it would. I, I suppose. What, what were you going to say? I was just going to say, I think the idea is that like, the essence of being your, your idea is unjust. Yeah. <coughs> Any amount of justice inside of that doesn't, doesn't take away from the fact that you are an unjust person and that eventually you will. Ah. Uh, so if you're, if you're just with the people that you're how long interacting that? with, yeah. but your organization is doing unjust things. Like let's say you're in a military unit, yeah. and you're within your military unit, nobody cheats, lies, steals from each other, they're all you know, very good to each other, but they're doing war crimes. That would be wrong. Yes. Even though you're being good to, to your fellow soldiers. Yeah. You're still committing war crimes. Yes, exactly. Yeah, what are you going to say? I mean, if they lose the war, then that's justice right there. If they end up winning the war, then and the war crimes were committed during it. Yeah. It's only a matter of time, I think, before the unjust they get punished. punished. No, uh, oh. crumbles within themselves because they find out what it's all based on. That's yeah. a really great segue now into the last part of this. Because um, Socrates, you may not have gotten this when you read through it. When he's talking about this, this problem of the just versus the unjust. So we have um, uh, personal relationships. Right? So you've got two people, the just and the unjust person, and how's it going to work out for them. And then you have um, societies or groups. They have to have some degree of justice within themselves in order to function, if, even if they're unjust to each other. And then within the person themselves, within the human being. Um, we can talk about people being well integrated or poorly integrated. And an unjust person, part of the reason why they're going to be unjust, from Socrates' point of view, and I think this is what you're getting at, is why people feel bad afterwards. They're not entirely unified. They're not entirely integrated. There's parts of them that are warring with each other. I think you've all experienced the, the condition of, of having um, multiple desires that can't all be satisfied at the same time, and you feel sort of like you're warring with yourself, or like you're, you're split this way and this way. Um, you've probably all experienced having a bad conscience about something, where you, part of you is, is perfectly happy that you got away with this thing, but there's a part of you that's also saying, that's not good. You did the wrong thing. And you're, you feel divided against yourself, right? Um, the human being, what we count as justice and injustice in the human being himself or herself. Justice means all the parts of the soul, parts of the personality, are integrated in harmony with each other, in agreement. Um, what would be injustice? The parts are warring or hostile to each other or divided, at least in what they're trying to get the person to do. And the person won't be happy with themselves. And the longer it goes on, the more profoundly unhappy they will be. And one way that you can try to integrate yourself is by wiping out the other parts of yourself that don't get along. Uh, 
Um, some people try to do this. And some people who want to be really tough do this. They try to wipe out the parts of themselves that feel um, tenderness, mercy, kindness towards other people, because that, that will feel better to, to get rid of that. And then you can just have one main motivation. Other people go the other way, and they, they don't deal with the fact that we as human beings, we are aggressive creatures. We do feel hostility towards each other, and they suppress that. And they're just all kind and gentle and all that sort of stuff. But then they start becoming passive aggressive, right? And you can see the hostility coming out. That's because they don't have justice in their soul. They have injustice in it, yeah. yeah I was going to say, if we take like McIntyre into account, we're somebody that keeps repeating unjust actions in our perception. Yes. It will become a just action at that point. So, they will see it as a just right. action on some level, so but then, they, they won't be completely integrated. Okay. And eventually, it's, it, it, will, it will start wearing at them. War criminals do end up having, usually, have a guilty conscience, unless they're just complete sadists. Some of them you know, never, never have any problem with what they do. Yeah. Well, even if they don't have guilty consciences, like even if that's, I don't know, I mean, they can kill everybody in the world. And get away with it, and they're still going to need to take their aggression out on somebody, so they're just not willing to Yeah. Um, you're, you're sort of making Socrates' point, which was going to get made again later in book four, that ultimately um, justice and injustice in this stuff is going to stem from having human beings who have justice in their souls, who actually have thought through it, worked out their, their Problems. And we don't start out automatically good for somebody like Plato. We don't start out automatically bad. We don't start out automatically good. We have to be trained towards the, the good. Um, justice has to be developed in our, our souls. So this is a good place to end. Um, and we're, we're going to pick up with, with this. Uh, next class, we're going to talk about the ring of Gyges and egoism and contract periods.